Good morning, good uh, uh, afternoon, or good evening, depending on what time zone that you are in. Um, based on the like pre-interview, the conversation that I just had with uh, Bob Moneybags, I'm really looking forward to continuing what we've already been talking about. And uh, again, the purpose of this show is to give everyone in the XRP Army or crypto world the opportunity for all of you to get to know the person a little bit better. And uh, it is uh, a, a real pleasure for me to be able to introduce everyone to um, Bob Moneybags. So, Bob, would you like to introduce yourself and say hello? Yeah, um, I'm Bob. If you haven't seen me on Twitter or YouTube, um, my YouTube channel is just Bob Moneybags. And um, my Twitter's at Fake Coin Expert. Thank you for having me on for the interview. It's a, a pleasure. I really enjoyed our conversation um, before we went on camera. And, you know, I like having these open talks, I like the format you have on the show. So once you asked me, I said, absolutely, let's do this, because I think this is more fun to me than most other things we could be doing with our time. Uh, me too. So the first thing that uh, we like to always ask everyone that comes on the show, Bob, is kind of um, what you would like to divulge and share is w what was your kind of life pre-crypto how you kind of ran into it, what you thought about it, and then if you found XRP and how you feel about that, and then where you feel like we are right now, and then where you feel like that we're heading. And we kind of use that as a, a framework of our friendly conversation and then just see where it go, you know, see where we go from Absolutely. that as the premise. So take off. Okay, so I'd say when I first came across crypto to any extent was about 10 years ago i didn't really get involved but i had friends that messed around with bitcoin um more or less just screwing around and buying stuff um and holding it on uh, hot wallets and buying stuff on the dark web and stuff um not anything that i know of hopefully but um <laughs> nothing illegal but they were just screwing around being high schoolers and um messing around with Bitcoin. And to me, I wasn't really familiar with the concept at all. I just heard of Bitcoin, but nothing past the surface. So for me, I thought it was not really worth the time. I thought it was cool that you can make money uh, electronic like that, but didn't really waste too much time with it. Um, and my friends kept telling me to get involved and they even offered to buy me some Bitcoin and they bought me some and sent me some and showed me how to set up a wallet. And, um, you know, I, kind of held it and had some interest and then just lost it for years. But I kept hearing about it throughout the years briefly, nothing more than it was associated with the dark web. So it had a bad connotation to its name. So had the wrong impression of Bitcoin and not much use case. So over the years kind of avoided it. And then around 2016, I, those same friends um, while we're off of college, they're telling me about other assets and what bitcoin has done so far and i'm like are you serious wait it's it's gone up that much there's got to be some sort of value to this why are people investing in this and that drew my interest of course obviously the financial side of it so i went into it and looked more into it my one friend actually was invested in xrp when it was sub a penny and he was telling me about ripple the company and that's and thankfully thanks to him he's a um he's an it guy so he's tech savvy with this stuff. So he's real familiar with it for many years, but he uh, introduced me to Ripple. Uh, I believe it was Ripple. Uh, I'm trying to think of that Card uh, Cardano and a few other um, things he introduced me to. And then Ripple really stuck out to me. Uh, so I looked into it a little bit, did more research. He, he finally convinced me. He, uh, he's like, yeah, here's the exchanges uh, you could buy it from. He uh, introduced me to Binance as well when that was new. Um, and I bought XRP, I think it was like three cents at the time and thinking, oh, cool. Maybe I can ride a little price wave. Didn't know much about it. And then I started to come across people like, um, Alex Cobb early in 2018 and stuff. And, uh, started to get into more of the logistics behind the company and what their purpose is and what they intend to do with this asset. And it's much bigger than just making a quick buck. It's a revolution. Um, financially so for me that's why i was like oh my god this is such a cool concept that nobody really knows about yet they're so naive of it they just think of bitcoin you ask 99 out of 100 people that will tell you that they hear a bitcoin probably but that same amount of people probably have never heard of xrp so i thought i was ahead of the ahead of the game so to speak so i invested in xrp saw the price go up 
And that got me eager, like most young people. You see money come in quick. Um, and then that's how it began. I, I saw these YouTubers. I saw. I remember Alex Cobb was the first one I looked at. I saw this young kid. Wasn't even 18 yet. And I'm sitting there thinking, holy crap. This guy's <laughs> one of the brightest people I've heard when he's talking about this. And he's not even 18 yet. Are you serious? And all the people in the group talking, he didn't have that many people at the time. I was just sitting there watching. It blew me away. It blew me away to the point where I'm like, wow, I really don't have my head wrapped around this, but I could tell this is something that I need to look further into. Absolutely. Without a doubt. I knew without a doubt I had to look into it. And then that's why I tell him every now and then I'm like, thanks for being you, Alex, because he was the one that first, I mean, there was others, but not many. So that's how it got me started into it. And then, you know, I've been suffering ever since. Not really. But. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, one thing, and again, whatever you feel comfortable sharing, but did you have uh, your background before you ran into Alex and before you ran into the Bitcoin? Did you have any kind of a financial background that led you to have an interest in this kind of thing? My college degree from Appalachian State, not Harvard, was right. in radio and TV communications, nothing to do with business or economics. But did, did you have any background that would have led you to have had an interest in this kind of thing to begin with? Yeah. So actually, uh, my I have a, a political science degree and then um, um, economics minor. So a little bit of background. But I remember in one of my classes, it was actually international relations. This uh, ties into uh, digital assets being used by other countries for influence. They were talking about possibility uh it was kind of we were in debate i forget how it started in it wasn't starting with bitcoin but it led to bitcoin and somebody was pulling up information about how um uh, certain countries uh could influence with digital dollars and hide them off of you know being tracked and was bringing this up and i thought it was a neat concept and i thought wow now i could see the actual influence behind having something like this i still didn't know much at the time I was like, now I see the importance of moving money, you know, at instant speeds, or so I thought at the time, at least with Bitcoin. But um, that was the first time that my background and my education actually slightly, I wouldn't say it taught me a lot. I had to do the rest of my own. But at least put my foot in the door. I'm like, wow, now I actually see why they want this. It moves money instantly compared to waiting a few days. It was a slight introduction in the door where I went, oh, okay, there's some value there. I could totally see it why uh, countries would want to invest in it or why individuals would. So I have a political science degree. I can't say my background directly resulted in me knowing enough other than the fact that introduced, they introduced it to me when we had a debate in class like five years ago. So. And, and so now having moved along into that, got it. And I appreciate that. So when you initially saw Bitcoin, you, you kind of were open-minded to that. But when you first saw XRP, did you have any barriers to overcome? Um, like I think a lot of us did in the beginning because it was known as the banker's coin. Did, did the fact that Ripple wanted to work with the man instead of trying to take the man down, did you have any obstacles to, you know, um, liking XRP because of that? No, because my mindset... Um I, I try to be open-minded, but I, I am a little, I wouldn't say Machiavellian. I'm just more of a real principled realist to some extent. So if you're working with people that have tremendous wealth, um, you know, obviously you might want to be on their side if it's in your own financial best interest. So I thought, um, you know, working with the banks, that would be more ideal. That wasn't my issue. Working with the banks, well, I in fact, I I thought that would help it flourish. I said that gives credibility. Seeing the people that are working on the board and seeing who they're working with, that's what I care about. And that wasn't my issue. My issue was, okay, can this ecosystem handle, you know, hundreds of thousands of transactions per second when you when you become global? Um, can uh, uh, what what about the hundred billion XRP? How is that going to be allocated throughout the years, and who's in control of how much? Those are the questions I asked where I'm like, okay, that I kind of need to know because there's a hundred billion XRP in circulation. I, I understand it's deflationary at a really slow rate, relatively speaking, but those are the things that I was more concerned about. It wasn't necessarily, and who controlled the big portion of it and how it was being held into a scrow. 
Uh, but working with the banks for me, I understand everybody has different opinions and there's a lot of uh, people that are anti-establishment and government and so forth and not really for that. But for me, that wasn't my issue because I knew financially that's in your best interest. But uh, it was just the allocation of these coins and, you know, what they were going to do with it. I got over that real quick when uh, DAI on a video that I was watching of his early on, when he said that, look, if, if you think that he uh, <clears throat> had a, a, a clip of Brad Garlinghouse and Brad was saying, if you think these people are going to give up what they've got, they're going to break out the tanks and the guns before they <laughs> just, you know, advocate their control and their power of the currency. So, and so I agree with that too. I, I understand the anarchist, I'm a libertarian, so I understand the, the anarchist point of view, but Hey, one of our greatest YouTuber influencers is uh, Sam. I am, and and he's an anarchist, and he loves XRP. So I got over that stuff fairly quickly. Right, absolutely. He's a perfect example, actually, because th that's good that you brought it up. Because his views are, I would say, um, pretty strong when it comes to being an anarchist. Uh, some things I and I've been open with him. There's some things I don't agree with, just like everybody else, but. Ultimately, you can see that uh, he does a really good job spelling out how putting it past that this has true value. And it's really clear how it's laid out in front of us. If you really look into it, that the potential is there. So he's one of the, he's one of my favorites, too, just because he does a really good job at speaking to dummies like me, relatively speaking. You know, I'm not that tech savvy when it comes to it. So you lay it out in front of us like that. That's what I like to hear. Dumb it down for me. And yep. He does a really good job at it, so um, that's a great example. Sam is one that, looking past his anarchist views, which sometimes I feel like get in the way, but that's like everybody else. Um, I feel like ultimately he looks past that and sees this value and lays it out in such a perfect manner. I, I couldn't even do it myself. I would start drooling if I tried to explain half of the stuff he did. So me too. Me too. And uh, so again, that's one of the things I just. I agree with Brad as well and DAI that, look, they're going to do this stuff whether we like it or not. Now, let me ask you this since we opened that up a little bit. Um, do you believe that this, and we I've heard this before from multiple people, do you feel like that XRP was a part of this plan all along by the powers that be, or do you feel like that the powers that be kind of noticed what they were doing after Ripple had started what they were doing and then kind of, figured that they're the ones doing the best or the closest to what we want to accomplish and then kind of decided to work with Ripple because, dude, how in the world did a little startup in San Francisco go from in 2012 where they were starting up to a $10 billion valuation? I mean, that just doesn't happen every day. Well, I think it's a uh... – I don't think it started up with uh, what people believe, um, in my personal opinion, that it was the powers that be that controlled this from the beginning. I don't know, I, but I do think it's a little bit of a mixture. I mean, you had people that were qualified and had the background and had the connections that started out on the board at Ripple from the beginning. I mean, you had a board member from uh, HSBC. You had one that was an advisor to the Clinton administration that was on the board. You have these people that are established that have these connections that started out with this company. So I do believe there's a little bit of a mixture there where you go, okay, they definitely had those interconnections from the beginning, but I don't think it was started out like a powerhouse, like the president sat down from the beginning or something. No, I don't think it was something that crazy, but, um, but I definitely think over time, it's definitely evolved where you see these central banks and these, these leaders, these world leaders actually working with Ripple and mentioning them. And you, and you talk about Lagarde too. That was a big one for me. When I saw Lagarde, I was like, holy crap, this is, if this isn't, you know, if this doesn't spell it out for people, I don't know what does. That was like the, the that was the icing on the cake for me with her. But even then, the meetings that uh, Brad Garlinghouse went to with Lagarde, you saw all those central bank leaders, you saw uh, those Middle Eastern leaders. Uh, it was clear as day to me. So I think it evolved over time and manifested itself into something much bigger and it allowed itself to grow in the way it should be the company ripple. But I don't think it started out as like there was world leaders and central banks ready to take the move to transition to this currency or anything. No, I think it evolved with those connections they already had on the board and um, slowly grew over time with their 
partnerships and their work. So have, have you, have you Bob followed the SPQR guys? Uh, a little bit. Like I said, I, I haven't watched everything, but I know, I, I know who they are. Yeah. Yeah. One, my favorite video that they did um, was the last one that they did the, before Lee did another one yesterday. Um, the truth um, and the end. And in that they introduced me to my favorite Ripple board member, Klaus von Gutenberg. And did you pick up on who that guy is? No, I've heard the name, but I don't really know too much of his background, no. Well, turns out that that uh, he joined the Ripple board, I believe, in 2014. And he is in the bloodline of the Medici. And oh. in Holy Roman terms, <laughs> the Medici is the Roman Holy Roman Empire family who started banking. And then they dominated it for like hundreds of decades. And then... Uh, the either the Flugers or the Fugers, I can't remember how to pronounce that name, that family, they pushed them in a power move out of the banking business in the Holy Roman Empire. And so when I saw that there was a Medici who was on the board of directors at Ripple starting in 2014 and then see all these connections of all these important people, it kind of leads me to believe it looks like the Medici have an interest in getting back in the banking business. <laughs> that that's incredible. I didn't even know that. And well, that's and that's what I'm saying. These the the connections were there. I just don't think it was. Uh, I don't think, and I could be wrong. I don't think it was. Uh, you know, governments overseeing this or anything. They definitely showed up to the ball late. It wasn't them. It could be when you say the powers that be people like them that had their own vested interest in this. So absolutely. Um, that's why I think it's a good mixture of the both. I think it manifested into something that's much larger now and will be in the next five years, 10 years. And, and uh, how about the, uh, the document that I think all XRP lovers have fell in love with the first time they saw it, the Everest document that love for crypto originally found for all of us. And that one page where it's got all the banks on the left, the XRP and the ledger in the middle, and then all of the companies over on the right-hand side. Um, and I think that SBI uh, is in Asia, that market is going to be, and Mr. Katal is going to be one of the things that really brings on a lot of the heat. Uh, do you feel like that we're going to get a lot of uh, the push towards adoption coming out of the East? Um, I think... Uh, if we do, it's because that they are so far ahead of us in regulation and just accepting this technology. So absolutely, I think the potential is there for it to grow in the East and then uh, following suit here. But I think it would be just because of, uh, like you were talking about with SBI, they've been so far ahead of the game. Um, these Asian countries are, are just transitioning into it and accepting it now, and they have been for the past few years. So. Um, I think absolutely they would develop. And that's because of that. They're so far ahead of the United States and some of these other European countries. So now, absolutely they could. Absolutely. Now, Bob, um, as far as the regulate regulatory clarity in the United States, have you been kind of, have you been interested in that and been kind of following along? And wh where do you feel like that we are in that regard now? Uh, yes and no. I mean, I, 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 every now and then I, I'll get articles of what has been presented in Congress or argued and the financial committee and, you know, like things like that I'll touch base with, but not daily. I don't follow up with it or anything. I, you'll, you'll bore yourself to death. I might as well watch paint dry on the wall if you're going to do that. Um, but I will say that we are, um, at least the, the discussions there, it's being brought up and that's something that's much better than we could say even three years ago, four or sorry, four years ago when I really got into it, that, that wasn't a thing, especially even taxing taxation. Surprised it took them that long to figure that out knowing the U S. So, um, well, Bobby, even as, as recently as just last November yeah. or October, we had Ma Maxine Waters saying, you know, uttering the famous phrase, Bitcom. Bitcom. And yeah. Now yeah. we've got the comptroller of the currency who, you know, Brian Brooks, who used to work at Coinbase coming out and 
talking, I mean, the guy's a crypto guy and Chris Giancarlo working on the Digital Dollar Act. I mean, to me, I see that the regulate regulatory clarity has really moved forward in the last six months. Oh, absolutely. And and a lot of people uh, carry a bad uh, connotation with the term lobbyist. And sometimes that's true. Sometimes they could be uh, promoting the wrong thing. But um, this is a perfect case of where you want money and lobbyists on your side. You have P companies like Ripple lobbying in Washington, D.C. You have all these other heads of these exchanges and companies, blockchain companies coming forward. And that's huge. All this money being put forward to uh, push these people out there in front of Congress and actually – helping educate them because remember like our discussion before we went live i like i said uh public all these public servants they're a jack of all trades and a master of none if they do their job appropriately they do it the right way they're going to have advisors and get guidance from those people that actually know what they're doing in that industry so it's good to see them actually taking the time to put them out there now i understand so, it, half of it's all a show for them to just grandstand and all that but still the fact that they're out there and educating them um, that's, that's huge. And who knows what's going to happen two years from now. I know we're going through a uh, pandemic right now, so there's other things to worry about, but beyond this and beyond the struggles that many are going through right now, how this is going to transition over. I'm just, I can't, I'm eager to see what happens. Well, and Bob, one of the things that, um, we talked about before we turned on the recording was taking a look at that beautiful USA debt clock. And I help bring, raise your attention down to the lower right-hand corner. How, how, how and, and again, I, it boggles my mind what's going on with our existing economy right now. Right. <clears throat> because for the last two months ago, when I first, uh, maybe that was the first time that I found that, um, I found that number $147 trillion in unfunded liabilities. And I kept saying that. And then last week, Brad Kimes revisited it, and he said $153 trillion worth of unfunded liabilities debt. Mm -hmm. So I had to go back and look at it again. Holy crap. We're averaging now going $3 trillion into unfunded liability debt every 30 days. I mean, do you, how much longer do you believe that they can kick that can down the road before we've got to do something? Well, see, that one's hard for me to even guess because if you would have asked me something 10 years ago about that, I would have said within the next 10 years. And then <laughs> somehow they carried along and kicked the can down the road. Um, we're at a point now where it's just uh, it's inevitable. We can't recover from that. And like you said, without a debt jubilee, without uh, some sort of clearance of debts and wiping out uh, some global debts, you can't re you'd have to reset completely there's no way that you can come back from that realistically and it's only getting worse with this pandemic so i don't know i realist the reality of things my reality would be sometime real soon then especially if this pandemic somehow gets way worse than we ever imagined not even just death wise and all that but economically i don't know it could be real soon but again this is a question that if you asked me 10 years ago, I would have been like, you're nuts if we go another 10, 20 years before this tips over. So I don't know. They somehow keep artificially holding on, but well, I don't the, think for that much longer. The most absurd thing that I saw, well, you and I talked about a, um, uh, $1.8 billion given to dead people in stimulus money. But even more absurd than that, Bob, is right. when I saw that Hertz – had filed bankruptcy and the following week their stock increased 12 percent i mean yeah that's ridiculous that's artificially inflating the economy that's uh, and that's just robbery right there of taxpayer dollars and that's like what we talked about with uh um um the churches the catholic churches where uh the article i saw it might be a little outdated now because if it's a week old it's outdated at this point right but the one i saw was like 75 percent of churches that filed for those uh the funding they got their funding 75 percent of them got the, the funding they requested and it might even be worse now but that was a few months ago but the point being well, this concept of the separation of church and state Where's that gone? Why is that all of a sudden just thrown out the way? Why are we funding? I, I'm all for 
you know, a church. I'm all for people practicing their religion and having a Me place too. to worship. Uh, power to you. I'm happy that you have uh, some sort of faith, and I'm fine with that. But there needs to be some clarity here, and you have to draw that line in the sand. What does this separation of church and state mean now? Because why are you funding these places that you're not collecting any kind of public funding from them to help? The, you're paying with the people's funds to pay for these churches that they already were granted immunity from taxes because of separation of church and state. So why are we having this double standard here? That's what I don't like. We need to draw that line in the sand, and these, a lot of this funding is going to places that it shouldn't be, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree, too. And I I heard the other day, and forgive me if I don't remember the right number, but I think that it was 70 countries had appealed to the IMF. So it's not just America. I mean, we're the global economic leader, supposedly. We're $153 trillion in unfunded liability debt. We're the leader, okay? But there, I heard, and I can't remember the exact number, but I think it was 70 member countries in the IMF had reached out to Georgina and asked for some assistance. So it's not just America that is, you know, getting crushed under this mountain of debt that the banksters have helped to create. So how how long can these other countries manage if we're the global leader, 150 three trillion dollars in unfunded liability I, I just don't see any other option besides a reset debt jubilee and then move forward with some other option yeah and that's like for many years the u.s has been in that point where you always think that they're beyond the point of return but they end up it, it comes down to um it, there's a textbook definition it's called uh, hegemonic stability theory so every uh, so often you have a major world power that, you know, controls the global economy and military wise, they control the whole world. So uh, you've had uh, the Roman Empire, Ottoman, things like and then the U.S. the past 30, 40 years, whatever. So um, now we're now we're wondering, you know, where's that power going to shift? Because the whole global economy is just on its it's on its toes now they're hanging on by a thread. So where's this power going to shift? So right now I think it's just at the point where everybody is just holding on for their dear life. So I don't think nobody really knows what's going to happen. I think the U S since they control everything and they artificially control it or manipulate it, I think that that kind of carries over globally. And we're going to see a lot of these countries collapse with their economies like uh, Deutsche bank and Germany. If you look into them, you see how much they control not just Germany's economy. You talk about the European Union. That's a whole world of trouble there. And you already see some of it. But you're having all these little pockets across the world that it's like a doom zone. You think, oh, okay, well, uh, we're going to spell out. Um, hold on. I'm sorry. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, sorry. I was lagging on my screen. Okay. Sorry. I was like, oh, no, I don't tell me I lost them. Okay. So you're going to have these little pockets So across the world where you go, okay, how much of the global economy is that controlling? And I don't think there's going to be a real shift anytime soon until the U.S. finally folds. And when that happens, my question is, where's that power shift to? This hegemonic stability theory, it's it's appropriate. It's right. But, like, where do we shift that power? And, you know, what do you say? It's going to China now? Where, is it going to Russia? And that's why we fund. My point I'm getting at is what, that's why the U.S., they keep increasing the military budget. $100 billion a year, more. Now it's like $600, $700 billion a year, the military budget. The only reason why we do that is, well, A, you have uh, military, you have the military-industrial complex you got to keep funding for shareholders and for production. Uh, you have vested interest there. And then B, it's to keep a stronghold on glo global governance. If you have a weak military, if people outpower you, that's where you're going to shift that power. That's my point I'm getting at. It's not... Everybody is holding on by that last thread. But if you strengthen your military and keep growing them and growing them, that's why we fund our military way more times than the rest of the world combined because we're afraid to lose that power. So we're holding on just because of our military strength. It's not because of our, 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 our production or how much we bring in or GDP, anything like that. Yes, that absolutely has value. But I'm saying it's not just that. It's our military governance. So that's the only thing holding us on. Now, how long we can carry that strength over? I don't know. Well, Bob, do you have any uh, any opinion at all on the pre-allocation theory where 
Ripple could, you know, allocate the escrow to the IMF and then they could dole that out to their member countries. And then let's just say, you know, value the XRP at a thousand per XRP to all of those countries. And then that would that would be a reset. So the, like the, uh, uh, you're saying like that, uh, what is it called? Is it like SDR or whatever? Yes. Yeah. So it'd be like an ESDR or something in that. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So um, again, I, I've heard that theory before and it, I, I'm open-minded to it. The only part I get confused is um, so when they allocate these funds to the IMF, is it just a, is it just a debt jubilee? It's a global reset and they go, okay, this is how we're going to fund these countries with X amount. Of, and, it, and then I get that, but is it going to work off of the same system of how, um, I don't know if they count them as votes or what, but the, the leading funding countries like the U S they get more voting power or more purchasing power. The SDR, is that going to work the same way? Is, well, from my understanding, and again, I'm no rocket scientologist or financial advisor, but to my understanding that they would allocate a percentage of whatever is in the bat, whatever the SDR is made up of right. to each individual company and then they, I mean, country, and then they would base how much they got based on the size of their economy and their contributions to the IMF and everything like that prior to it. Is that what it's correct? So, okay. So be, that's, that was the part I was a little confused about. Cause I, cause I, what the way I've heard it before and I just might not have heard everything obviously. So um, I got confused and thought, okay, we're just having a reset and we're funding these countries. How do we allocate those funds accordingly? Is it cause, cause um my you understanding know, countries what, like the US or the UK, they fund way more than some smaller third world country is going to ever contribute. So. And I could be mistaken, but un, under the way that I understood it, it would be kind of based on their GDP. In okay. other words, yeah. you know, in other words, America was the biggest, so they'd get the biggest pile of SDR. And then gotcha. Britain, based on their economy, would be theirs. And then if you think about it, then they give, let's say they give 10 billion XR or SDR to the U.S. And then they put a value of each one of them at $1,000. Well, then there's everything that can wipe the debt clean. Now, again, that doesn't mean that's what it is. It just means that that's Scott's elementary that's, understanding of it. Right. But, yeah. Right. Okay. All right. I got you now. That makes much more sense. Okay. Yeah. I'm I mean, my other question about that theory is what happens to funds that are held by individual investors? Like, how would you uh, and I, I take it as it's funds that are in a scrow that they would just move over to countries. But that's my but, understanding. But but what but what would be the, the um, interpretation? How would it carry over to individual investors? Like, will we just sell our SDR on the market? Because I know regular SDR, you can't own. I can't be like, I have 500 SDR, which is just a basket of currencies, but I can't just be like, I can't tangibly be like, oh, I have 500 SDR and I could sell it to you on a market, but I can't do that. It's controlled by gun countries. So I don't know if they're going to, my confusion as well is do they seize and take control of the, the rest of the SDR or do they just block it off? And I don't know. Cause regular SDR, you can't own it. I, I can't buy SDR off of you. Right. So it's by the country, but what we would, uh, I'm not sure either. Or maybe a buyback or something. I don't know. What what we would, uh, the probably the best is to, uh, I'll try to see if I can, uh, see if I can try to get Brad Kimes because he's no, he has talked about that more than anyone, any other influencer that I've seen mm -hmm. talk about it. <clears throat> and uh, I'll see if I can get him to take a look at our interview and then uh, post a comment to, help further explain that and any other person watching this video um if you have a better understanding of it than maybe bob and i do uh, please feel free to leave a comment and uh, help us understand this a little bit better <clears throat> i'm just again i'm just not sure what in the world they're going to do the, but the, they can't they got to do something i'm not exactly sure what solution they're going to come up with but they got to do something i just i don't see how, how we can stand another even two years of the way that it's going right now. Oh, absolutely. I think uh, you're seeing it carry over right now. I, 
even before the pandemic, um, you were seeing uh, people getting tired of holding on to this and wondering, you know, how long it's going to go. And and you're going to get that uh, with any kind of investment. You're going to get people wondering because the longer you hold your money there, it's called patience capital. That's how you make money. That's one of the many ways you can be very successful in investing. Now I understand crypto. It's, there's a lot more risk at play, but um, if you don't have the patience to hold on to an asset for that long, you're going to start getting antsy and bitter and you're going to see more people raise those questions or, you know, make something a bigger issue than it is and start to raise other questions. So it's happened. I've seen it already. And then now that you have a pandemic, a global pandemic and people that are struggling out there, some of the last things they're going to worry about is should I be holding on to this? Well, I might need money to feed my kids or pay rent or something. So I kind of understand it. I I totally do. Um, But I I definitely don't think they're just going to let it sit idle with how much they've done so far. Maybe given the certain, the, the circumstances right now, it's not going to do much maybe just because of what's going on. But I don't think at all, I'm still invested in this and still uh, like I have my questions like I did from day one, but I'm not doubting it to the point where I go, wow, this is a waste of my time. I'm done. No, I set a plan. I'm still sticking to it because if you strongly believe in your investment, you got to be willing to hold on to it for many years, or it could be, it could be three years. It could be two years or it could be 10 years. Who knows? But if you're strongly uh, interested in an investment and you really believe in its backing, its foundation and its partnerships, um, I think it's a no brainer. I'm going to still hold it, but I'm going to raise those questions. Like these questions that we talked about with the pre-allocation theory, these are quite, that's just examples. There's many questions you can have. And I think it's perfectly healthy for people to ask these questions, especially with any kind of investment. And I think we've gone, uh, we've slowly shifted away from this mindset. I think just in general, if you look at the XRP community, but there was a point in time where it was so, uh, it was more of like, like I talked to you before we started recording, it was like the confirmation bias. Somebody raised that question. It was more problematic than, you know, help uh, to, you know, be a cure of anything. Because if you raise these questions, that's where it's going to help you understand your investment a lot more and you can learn something from it. But we got in that mindset just as a whole in general, where people were, you know, anti, you know, uh, they, they, they put them into factions. It was like, Oh, you're a maxi or you're this and that. Like if you question anything, I've been called a BTC maxi and I hold a lot of XRP and I'm like, what for raising a question? I didn't trash ripple or anything. I just raised a question. And if they answer great, or if somebody else answers, that's the mindset we need to get in, especially in times like this where it's going to be very stale, boring, rough. You're not going to see – you might. I mean, you might see next week it might go up a lot. I don't know. But most likely you're not going to see anything life-changing during this time. Hopefully I'm wrong, but just the reality of things. Uh, so that's the mindset I urge people, just at least be more open-minded and ask those questions like you well, and I do. Yeah, well, Bob, I'm a a multi coin holder. Yeah, me too. Um, yep. And what I, you know, what I've done is I've tried to look at different projects and evaluate them all to see if I feel like that they are solving a problem, and if they've got a good team of people behind them that can follow through to make it happen. Because it, you know, I'm old enough now to understand that just having a fantastic idea doesn't. That's not. That's not all of the the recipe you've right. got to have a good team of people running a company to pull it off. Um, Bezos had a great idea of selling books and then expanding it to selling everything, but he put together a hell of a good team of people to help bring that to fruition. And so <clears throat> the maxi attitude is just something that drives me absolutely berserk because um, again, if I look back in history, it tends to repeat. If I go back to the blockchain, uh, excuse me, to the dot com boom, I've got Facebook, I've got Google, I've got Amazon, I've got uh, uh, Alibaba. All right, they're more than one successful business out of dot com, and there is going to be more than one winner in the blockchain boom. And how people can narrow their focus to only having a maxi attitude about one crypto project is just the, I cannot wrap my head around the maxi attitude. Yeah. And I think, and I think part of it, 
just in general is um, not only do people not want to doubt their investment and um, act like there's flaws or anything like that and then start freaking out because that's natural. Um, they also don't want to, I've noticed a trend where some people, and this isn't everybody, this is just these maxis that we talk about where you don't want to act like you were naive and didn't know that at the time. No. And I think that's like, I'll give you an example. Judges every single year, they have to go to the state Capitol. Uh, it depends on the state, I'm sure. But in Ohio, where I'm at, in Ohio, the state judges, they have to go to Columbus every year and re-educate themselves. If you're a judge for 40 years, it doesn't matter. You take classes at least once a year to help educate your, better educate yourself on the laws that you have been practicing on for 40 years. So, and that's what you should be doing with this. I don't care if you've been in it for one week or five years. It doesn't matter. We should be re-educating ourselves constantly. And that's why some of you guys that come out here and and like you come out here and ask these people questions, we learn something from each person. Even if it's something that we think is wrong, it's a different take on it. And it's a different approach on how we can tackle an issue, generally speaking. So I think um, that's the mindset that people need to get into that more moderate view and also diversifying. I like diversifying, just like you said, I have a few assets that I own as well. And I've held on to for a while just because I believe in them all. I think, do they have their flaws? Absolutely. Bitcoin has its flaws for sure that like we talked about, but I still hold it because I think as of right now, it holds some value. How much? Me too. You know, we couldn't answer that, but um, that could be a problem. Some other asset could solve later on down the road, like XRP or whatever. So um, that that's what people need to do. They need to be open-minded and most people are, but there's some uh, not just with XRP, but with any kind of asset that you ever will invest in or look into, there's going to be people on extremes on both sides. So, Well, and, you know, not knowing is one thing. You know, I don't have any problem at all with being ignorant uh, because that Dang, to me, yeah. Bob, that to me is just an opportunity for me to learn something. Exactly. But it's a whole different ball game, willful ignorance. When, mm -hmm. when a person is just closing their mind off, that's the part that I just... I, I don't understand. And and again, we're in the crypto world. We are, I hope, the solution to the fiat problem. So, you know, if we're going to be pissed off or be closed minded about something, put, send that angst towards Jamie Dimon, you know, the, the banksters, the fiat, that. I mean, yeah. not another crypto project that's trying to solve a problem. It, it just doesn't make any sense to me at all. And I run across that um, in um, I run across that in Twitter from time to time, um, running across people that seem to have a maxi attitude. Right. And that just it's just goes against the way that I think. It just does. Yeah. Now here, I, absolutely, and I I think to add on to your point. There's a difference. There's people that are in this just to invest, to make quick money and just normal investors. And that, I mean, that's fine. If that's your, uh, and you know, that's your agenda, then so be it. There's people that do daily trades and they invest and they're good at it. They work for a hedge fund or something. That's fine. Um, you know, you, you don't feel like it's a viable option to be into an asset right now. That's one thing for your best financial interest, but to start hating on one just because it's not working in your favor or you lost some money. That's part of the risk of getting into it. And it takes time to grow something that's that big as that yep. important in our whole financial uh, system. So I do still believe that could happen, but I do also analyze and um, make myself aware of the risk of any kind of investment. So you have to, like I say, and most people will agree with this, Invest what you're willing to lose. So if I'm willing to lose this to, I don't think it's going to go to zero, but I'm just saying hypothetically went to zero and I lost everything. I could walk away and be fine. I mean, obviously I wouldn't be thrilled, but I can live, I can eat and I can pay. Some people get too interested in the quick buck and they put way more than they can afford to lose. And that's your right with your money. You could do whatever, but don't be too surprised if it comes back to bite you in the tail. So well, I learned uh, a while back in my life experience that there's a difference between enthusiasm and stupidity. Right. So, I like what you said. Yes. 
not a financial advisor. This is not financial advice. However, only invest what you can comfortably have it exactly. all go by and it doesn't wreck your life. I had an interesting experience this morning on, uh, on the Facebook. Um, I don't know how I got into a thread about uh, there seems to be, and I don't know whether Dave Ramsey wrote it or whether he's being attributed to have written it, but he's putting out a, an exhaustive pair, uh, uh, article about the dangers of this cashless society that we're all being pushed into. And all of these people on Facebook in this thread, and it just gave me an idea, Bob, of just truly how ahead of the game we all really are in this crypto space right now that we don't really recognize it that much <clears throat> because there must have been 35 people in that thread that were all saying, we have to make sure we stop it. We can't let this happen. All of our freedoms are going. Well, Bob, we're already 95% in a cashless society anyway. What, exactly. what, did, what, what do these people, and, and do these people, one of the things that I wrote in Facebook was, uh, do you really think that they're not going to go ahead with what they've got planned because you don't like it? Yeah, exactly. And, and this, one, this one lady, I was I one, oh, one, go ahead, go ahead, you're fine. Before I forget, this one lady said, "I'm just going to keep spending my money and and count out exact change." I mean, the woman doesn't grasp the idea here that right. the vendors are going to stop taking that as a form of payment. Right. And and uh, I think part of that issue, because I have coworkers that are um, uh, a little bit older, they're about, you know, mid 70s or so, I would say, give or take a few years. Um, but they're from that, that time and era where, um, you know, they are used to handling cash, physical cash, and they still don't even really use credit cards that much, you know, and if they do, they write a check in and whatever, power to them. But um, it took me a while because they knew I was interested in digital assets to show them what the actual use case is, how it's valuable. And, and one thing I, that um, I should just tell people to give them this piece of advice because it might work on somebody a little bit easier. Everybody has their own ways of convincing others. But what I did with them, I needed to show them something right in front of their eyes, tangible. And I think since it's digital, they don't really grasp that concept easily because they're so used to physical cash, having control over their money physically. And they lose that comfort level if it's out of their hands. So um, I showed them, what was it? Oh, I went to um, the XRP tip bot and I went to XRP tip bot stats, um, which is another website. And um, you could track like each user that... Um, you know, how much tips they have, their account balance, if they send a tip, who they send it to, whatever. You can track anything on the tip bot basically with it. So I said, look at, um, I forget which charity it was. I think it's the one that Wandering Wear does with the um, trees. So there's a charity. I just contributed a few XRP just to show as an example. I said, do you see this QR code? Do you want me to send money to that charity? Um, or to that person. You want me to send it to somebody else? And I sent one to that charity and I sent one to one of my other friends and uh, I scanned it, sent it, and then I refreshed the page and it said it sent at this exact time and it was immediate and it was in their account and that opened their eyes a little bit. And I know that's not that doesn't explain everything to them, but that was just enough to get them in the door where they were like, wow, that was instant. That, that literally sent that instantaneously right from point A to point B he has your XRP. And then I tell him, I'm like, well, think about on ramps and off ramps, moving money instantaneously and think of a bigger picture besides the tip bot. I just show them the tip bot first, get their foot in the door and then right. add the others and go think of on ramps, fiat, off ramps, everything in different countries. Think of instantaneously moving wealth. See how easy that was. Now carry that over in a bigger scale and it opened their eyes and they're very more open-minded now about it. They still are learning and it takes time. Obviously we're all learning, but they at least have their foot in the door and it, it opens the, the realm of reality to them. They go, wow, that's actually really useful. So um, sometimes people just don't really see something until they actually have it right in front of their eyes. Um, well, one, one, thing that, one thing this lady was talking about as well is that, you know, how am I going to tip my, hairstylist, how am I going to tip my grandkids and give them money and that kind of thing? 
And uh, again, these people, I mean, my response back was, hey, we're going mobile and we're going digital. It's right. all going to it's all going to be done on the phone and your kid, the grandkids are going to have phones too. So, you know, it's right. I, my, it just my, uh, well, I mean, the only thing is if you're working for tips, you could, uh, I mean, if everything's going cashless and we scan to pay for stuff, you could, you could add a tip as well. And I'm, you know, like we'll go that route easily. We already do it with cards. So uh, now oh. if you're working for tips, and you're wondering about, okay, well, now i got to file more of my taxes and stuff because I've been there when I was a lot younger and I had to work for tips. You just check that you made whatever. And yep. so, yeah, but even then, I would argue I'd counter that and say, well, you might actually earn more because it's easier for somebody to send you money on their phone once they're aware of how to do it. It's harder to break a 20 and get singles. It's more of a pain in the butt to do that and then tip somebody a few bucks for like a $10 meal or something. Yep. It's harder to do that are just annoying. It's just tedious. It's maybe not hard, but then if you had it on your phone, you go, okay, you tip that and it's instantaneous. I feel like people would have more incentive if it's a lot easier and they're not seeing their money going away. They're, there's, it's like a credit card. You don't see your money until you look at the bill and go, oh my God, I spent that much this month. I got to pay right. that. So I'd say I'd counter it with, you'd still be fine. I, I think um, I, I think you really work out even at like a small consumer level for people that work for tips or, you know, hairstylists, whatever. And another thing that uh, one of the ladies said in that uh, Facebook chat was, well, a kid doesn't have a credit card. And I, I had to say, look, the, you know, the physical credit cards are probably going to be going away as well because everything is going to be done on the phone. And again, my, my point of bringing that up to you, Bob, was is that people have got like us really need every now and then to kind of try to understand and take a step back. And just understand how early on we are in this adoption curve of all of this asset class. I mean, but it re it really, honestly, I try to remind myself of that regularly. But that actually was kind of eye opening today when I saw every single person in that Facebook thread were all saying the same thing. And not one of them was saying, hey, you know, there is kind of another side of this. And hey, you know, they are going to do it no matter how we feel about it. And the reality with that, that Facebook post, um, those are just people that, like I said before, they come from that time and era, which I understand. They come from physical cash. They like it in their hands. They like, they like to actually have tangible proof of their wealth, or at least in their minds, they're controlling it. Now, you can argue about the wealth, the value of the dollar, whatever. Not my point. But um, my thing is those people, those are the ones that are most outspoken that are really against that. There's most people in the middle that don't have any idea and they just don't they don't involve themselves with it just because they don't know. They don't want to speak on something they don't know. And the very little uh, percentage of people that even do know, they're not looking at that. Not enough. You, there's people, there might be you and 10 others out of 10,000 that know, and not enough of them are going to comment when there's people that have been dealing with cash their whole lives that feel threatened. They feel like their wealth and security are threatened because they don't know enough about it. So there's still a lot of people that just don't know and they don't comment in. You're only going to see the negative ones because – that's like when you look at reviews of something and you see a lot of bad reviews. Not a lot of people are going to leave good reviews. Sometimes they do, but you're more likely to see negative reviews because you're more pissed off. You go, oh, let me leave a review and let other people know. You're more, It's more enticing to leave that review for yourself because you're so aggravated and you feel like you've been wronged in some way. So that's just right. like that Facebook post. They feel like they're being wrong. There's plenty of people that just need to be educated and yep. they don't involve with that. So. Well, I tried to be as helpful and neutral and ed and be as much of an education responder in that particular setting as I could be. Now, Bob, um, kind of as we wrap up, there's uh, two things. Number one, um, I, I always like, as I've met a new friend in the space, to go ahead and throw a, an invitation in the future out there for you to come back because I've really enjoyed getting to know you. So I'd like to throw out an invitation for us to pick up this conversation again at a later date. Absolutely, um, I'd love that. And another thing is anyone that I'm on a mission. I, I'm trying to get as many people in the XRP army to make a statement and be able to get a snapshot of how they feel everything is going and for anyone that I have been inviting that I've been getting some hesitation from, 
what message would you give to them? Has this been a horrible experience? I mean, anything bad happened in our conversation today that other people might want to avoid? Yeah, I, I think, um, I think people that are, well, first of all, I'm going to say this, uh, if you're skeptical to come on here or feel uncomfortable, uh, I mean, I don't think you should feel the need to feel uncomfortable because I think you've been a great host and it's been very open-minded. I love our discussion. Uh, it doesn't feel contentious. Sometimes you talk to people and they're just ready to start swinging. But, um, you know, that these are the conversations I like where it makes you think you got to grapple for, you know, your words and think, okay, well, how would you do that? Or, you know, you have to raise your own questions. I love people that think that way. So I love people that ask questions about their own argument even because sometimes the best people, the best lawyers learn how to fight their own argument. So I always use judicial examples, I know, but it proves the point. The best people question themselves, and that's what you should be doing every day. And I think you do a really good example of it, and you seem like one of the more open-minded people. So I urge people to uh, come on to this show uh, so we can all learn more about you and your perspectives because I think it'll be helpful for all of us, not just yourself. And, and one of the things that one demographic in our community that I have really been trying as hard as I possibly can is to get more of our women. You know, we've got Crypto Eddie, and I refer to her. She's a friend of mine. I, can, I refer to her as the standard. I've interviewed uh, uh, Boo Boo, um, XRP Rose, and I am on a mission to try and get more of our great, fantastic women in our community to come on here and give, you know, your share your story with everyone because we've got more than enough testosterone flowing around <laughs> in the world and we need more estrogen on the XRP Army News Show. Absolutely. So what would how do you feel about, you know, would you like to be able to hear from more of the women in the XRP army and in crypto in general. Oh, absolutely. And I think that, uh, uh, well, I, I should say, I don't think I know that there are plenty of women out there that they don't necessarily uh, voice their opinion enough and maybe just for their own reasons. So be it, but you get to talk to them and you, you learn a lot from them. Crypto Eddie is outspoken. So that's an obvious example. So a lot of us know a lot from her, but, um, even then, some of our chats in the background we have, you know, private chats with groups of people we have in them, she'll spark a conversation. And I see some of these people that I don't really hear much from and how they engage in the conversation. And I go, wow, you're very bright. And um, I think it would be refreshing to see uh, some women voice their opinions out there because I know there's plenty of bright women out there that are way more intelligent than I am and many others that um, I feel like it would do some justice if they voiced their opinion. There's too many guys out here, like you said, that swing their egos around. So sometimes it's nice to have that offset. I, I couldn't agree more. And um, last thing, um, to anyone out there that when XRP moons and they could uh, by accident end up falling into sudden wealth syndrome, is there any – warning out there or way uh, sage advice that you would like to give people as they prepare. I'm fortunate that this has not happened in my life until I'm 58. Um, if all of this was happening for me when I was 28, I pro when it moons, and I believe it will, then I probably would have just frittered it all away. So right. anything that you would tell people about trying to prepare for what's going to happen and then how they can take advantage of it in a sensible way. Well, how I would do it, or I'd like to believe I'll do it at least is, um, well, if I had, if you come into sudden wealth, first and foremost, don't get too many people involved with your money. That's something that I have family members that have always told me and have close friends that have money that have told me that don't get too many people involved with your money. Cause that's, uh, too much trouble that can tie up into your financial life. So um, also um, put a lot of your money away in investments and hide your money from yourself. So that's another thing. I mean, don't, uh, don't, you know, be too cheap and not spend anything, enjoy your life, but you got to live on, you got to live on, uh, you know, expected reality, how much money you're going to make after this. Say if you make, 
a million dollars, is that going to be enough to set you for the rest of your life? No, you want to build a better future for yourself and be comfortable, but maybe put a good portion of the way into something. Maybe you wanted to always start that business and you never had the funds. So you can go ahead and do that. Or maybe you just want to invest in something and have a uh, residual income of some sorts. And that's fine. Maybe you want investment properties or whatever. Look into something that might help better your life and make some sort of comfortable, steady flow of income as well as enjoying it too. Don't, don't focus on too much spending because when you do that, you might enjoy one or two years. I'll tell you what, if you're broke after all of that, and you'll probably end up owing more money than you did before this all started because you'll screw up your taxes, you'll screw up everything. You'll be way worse off. So how I look at it, that's like how I look at my savings account. So how I look at my savings account, I put a certain percentage there and I don't even uh, I don't even look at it until I need it for something. But like after I spend on my bills and this and that, I have a certain percentage I put in there. I don't even look at it because if I look at it, I'm, I check on it obviously once in a while, but I don't look at it daily or anything crazy and I don't touch it. So if I do that, it keeps the study in there. And same with my portfolio, same as my investment portfolio. I have money that comes out of my paycheck at work or just that I take out on my own behalf. I put in my investment portfolio and I have long-term investments. I just do not look at and I'd make steady, slow income throughout the years. So, I mean, really it's up to you what you want to do with your money, but um, I'm not telling you what to do because like you said before, we're no financial advisors. We're just common Joes out here having a good time. But I definitely say put a lot of the money away in smart investments and be wise with your decisions because I've had a friend that actually won, a family friend, I should say, that won a lottery about 10 years ago, $3 million on a scratch-off ticket. And he was a bar owner in New York bar owner that he won a scratch off he went to the corner store right down the road on his way home got a scratch off ticket won three million dollars and in a year and a half he owed three hundred thousand dollars in tax he owed three hundred thousand dollars in tax so he was three hundred thousand dollars in debt from being up three million because obviously they take taxes out and everything he just blew it all on a new home which is fine but then all these other things and he's having a worse life now because of it he's still trying to recoup so don't think of the immediate wealth. Think of what you're going to do with that wealth afterwards. Make yourself wealthier. Good. Good advice. I like that. All right. So, uh, again, I'd like to thank you very, very, very much. I've uh, very much enjoyed our conversation. One of the goals that I have is I'm trying to, to meet, as I've mentioned before, as many new friends in the community. So after the moon, um, maybe that some of us that are like-minded, uh, might like to form relationships and maybe find some projects that we might want to work on together or might like if they tokenize everything, maybe there's some real estate we'd like to go in together on. But the only way that that's going to happen is if we get to know each other and find out if we're coming from the same place and we've got that interest that we'd like to do that together. So that's one of the reasons I'm trying to get out there and meet as many of the people in the community as I can. So Bob, appreciate it. I appreciate you having me. Thank you, everyone. All right, take care. And I got one quick thing uh, after I turn this thing off and then uh, we'll say goodbye. All right, take care, everyone. Have a great day.